Hello, lords and ladies of the internet. I'm the King of Candor, and today I'm going to be talking about the history of half orcs in fantasy. Half orcs are the crossbreeding of a human and an orc with a mixture of traits of both. They are musclier than humans, but have softer features and smaller tusks than orcs. Often, they are torn between both societies, with neither quite accepting them. So, where do these half-orcs come from? Well, strangely enough, it starts with Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien made orcs for his Lord of the Rings and Hobbit books. For a full breakdown of the history of the orcs, go watch my History of Orcs video linked here. In the quick version, orcs are corrupted elves who have been turned into monsters which attack and work for the Dark Lord. They also might just be evil spawned from the earth, but the point is they're evil monsters who serve darkness. It is important to remember that these orcs would look and act more like what we think of as goblins. In fact, goblin and orc were often used interchangeably in Tolkien's works. Half orcs are only mentioned a few times in Tolkien's work. The first time is in the Fellowship of the Ring, when Frodo sees a southerner that he says looks like he has more than half goblin blood. The second time is in the Two Towers, when Treebeard is trying to understand these strange orcs that Saruman has created, and it's said by Gomling when the orcs are attacking Helm's Deep. These half orcs also return during the scouring of the Shire under the control of Saruman once again. Now this is where the story gets really strange and difficult to follow. You see, Professor Tolkien was never happy with the way he explained and designed orcs. This is important because this affects how the half-orc is designed. There are a lot of philosophical questions about the nature of good and evil and if a totally evil race can exist, but that warrants its own video that I will one day make. All you need to know right now is Orcs are created by Sauron and are the true embodiment of evil, whereas half-orcs are created by Saruman. The half-orcs I pointed out earlier are always in relationship to Saruman, and it's very unclear in the work if these are a different breed of orc, or an actual half-orc that is a hybrid between a man and an orc, or a magically enhanced man to be given the features of an orc. Or finally, it could just be an insult to a man who has sided with evil. Unfortunately, it's very unclear in the works. What makes this discussion and categorization even more confusing is, later on in one of his letters, Tolkien commented that Saruman had been planning this for years, so he had orcs and humans breed together. The same comment in that letter complicates things even further by making two categories, orc men and man orcs. Orc men are noted as being, quote, more treacherous and vile, end quote, which sounds to me like the spying and subterfuge that happened while the hobbits were in the Bree area. However, a man orc is noted as being stronger and more cunning than regular orcs. A third very strange wrinkle in all of this is the Urukai. They are called half orcs at the Battle of Helm's Deep, like Gamling, which I mentioned above, and they call themselves Urukai when asked by Aragorn. However, the Urukai are also clearly more powerful and stronger than regular orcs, and are a different breed entirely from half orcs because of the lack of them at the scouring of the Shire later on. This entire mess is what Dungeons and Dragons was handed when they tried to adopt this race for their game. The original version of D&D did not include half-orcs, and they were only included because people demanded them from Gary Gygax. Or at least that's the story you've been told by other people. It's surprisingly false. The first mention of the half-orc in official Dungeons and Dragons products is from the 1977 Advanced D&D Bestiary. However, Gary Gygax on multiple occasions has said he played a half-orc assassin for an evil home game in 1974 for OD&D, which is the version that came out before first edition. The additions and numbering are confusing due to legal reasons, 
So this means that they were testing and had the ideas of a half-orc before the game was widespread and demand for them was made. During this version of the half-orc, it is noted that orcs can breed with almost anything. Most of the time, 90%, they come out looking and acting exactly like regular orcs. However, 10% of the time, they were allowed to pass as a human. This version who can pass as a human is actually the playable race. Back then, they were only allowed to be thieves and assassins and chaotic clerics, but not much else. The original half-orcs are much more lithe and sneaky compared to their modern renditions. It is around the same time as the half-orc that the half-ogre is created. This is important because a lot of the designers at the time found out that players liked these options not because they wanted to have a fully realized world, but because they wanted to min-max their characters. Min-maxing is getting the most out of your character build. This is why the half-orcs were rewritten a few times, and the half-ogres were slowly dropped. If you've watched my orc video, which I mentioned earlier, you will know around this time is when Games Workshop introduced their version of the orc, which are bigger and greener and meaner, and the combination of these three led to the modern orc. Because the modern orc got stronger, obviously the half-orc would have to get stronger too. During the third edition rewrite, it was determined that orcs are still bestial monsters. Therefore, players who wished to play an orc had to play a half-orc. This was a bit of a concession to satisfy all parties, because Dungeons & Dragons Fantasy and the way it had it set up, you must have half-orcs in the setting, and full orcs really shouldn't be playable races. Of course, the modern versions of the games have played that, but they've also made orcs less bestial and no longer purely aligned with chaos and evil. Now, I know a lot of you have been waiting for me to mention this, but we must discuss a little bit about the lore reasons half-orcs exist. Before we do it, since I'm most likely going to get punished by YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you enjoyed the content, share the videos so I can grow. In their original description, the half-orc was noted as being created from, quote, unfortunate encounters. Many people read this online as non-consensual relationships, but that's not necessarily true. The old school D&D books had a bit of a sense of humor about it, where it would mock and belittle some people. I don't think this was originally meant to mean what people think it means. I believe it originally meant something like accidentally sleeping with a very ugly person. We all know those stories. You get drunk at the local festival after enjoying a bit too much of the mead, and you know, she starts looking kind of cute. However, with the orc penchant for raiding, I can see why the non-consensual encounters was assumed. I do want it noted though, that it is never directly stated in the original. Now, onto something a bit brighter. One of my favorite parts about making these videos for you all, is when I can find some information that is lost or obscure. One of my personal favorites is during my History of Cobalt video, when I found out the connection to Greece that everybody cites, but nobody knew where that's from. That video is linked here if you want to go watch it after this one. Now, what does strange and obscure content have to do with half-orcs? Well, I bring you Skandar Ground, the half-orc behemoth. Skandar Ground is the main character from the Chaos series. This series follows the half-orc warrior on his epic quest of murder and mayhem. What's really interesting about this series is it's written from the perspective of a bad guy and it follows a home game of Dungeons & Dragons. In fact, from what I could tell, it seems like everybody's a jerk in this series. For example, the Druids believe in true neutrality, so in order to keep things truly neutral, if there are too many good people in the world, they just start massacring villages, which I find hysterical and fascinating. Unfortunately, I'm going to tell you this now before I explain more, you cannot read this series unless you speak Hungarian. I don't speak Hungarian or read Hungarian for the record. Everything I've learned about this series has been through the reading of other mediums online, so if you can read Hungarian and want to talk about this more in the comments, I will gladly pin the best comment on this below. 
this is a blind spot that I could not find anybody who read Hungarian for to help explain this to me. So, back to Skandar. As I mentioned before, he's a total jerk. The book opens with him killing a guy and then complaining that when he bashed the guy's head in, he dented the helmet, which makes it less valuable. <laughs> what an upstanding guy. He then gets even more upset when the dead man's shoes don't fit him. So as a consolation, he puts on his old cloak that smells like chicken guts. What a fantastic image, isn't it? This series is really popular in Hungary, from what I could tell, and it's kind of like how the Witcher books are popular in Poland. I'm not saying it's nearly as good as The Witcher, of course, but that's solely because I have been able to read this. What's really interesting is if you're familiar with a lot of old school D&D modules, you can actually see which modules Skandar was a player character in. The first book has a bunch of side quests from the Sinister Secrets of Saltmarsh module. However, the majority of the first adventure is actually the Secrets of Bone Hill module. What's really neat is the Game Master and the author, I'm not sure which one, actually took characters that were introduced in Bone Hill and fleshed them out into full NPCs. These are people who have entire quests and other related storylines to them. Lokinda, the half-orc, who is a minor mercenary in the original module, is turned into Bloody Lucy, a half-orc assassin who also acts as a love interest for Skandar. Kind of like Catwoman and Batman, from what I can tell. Of course, Bloody Lucy seems to be much more violent, and the use of assassin as her job description should tell you some of her morals and ethics. Sticking close to D&D-related content, the only other famous half-orc I could find is Ford from Critical Role. When playing Ford, Travis Willingham did a great job at capturing a man between worlds. His multiracial nature didn't allow him to be respected by full orcs, and he was too monstrous for humans. He also shaved his tusks down because of this, and during his adventures, Ford gradually grew more confident in himself and became fully his own man. And from here, honestly, there's not a whole lot of other famous half-orcs. Outside of Dungeons and & Dragons and things spawned from D&D, such as Pathfinder, half-orcs are noticeably absent in almost all other fantasy. There is nothing in Elder Scrolls, Shadowrun, Discworld, Warhammer, or any other major fantasy I could find, except one, the Warcraft setting. Half-orcs in Warcraft are extremely rare. From what I could find, there are only 15 named half-orcs in all of Warcraft media, with the wiki noting three as non-canon. And seven of these are random names for the Beastmaster unit in Warcraft 3. This leaves only five unique named half-orcs in all of their media. Of these, three are from a clan of half-orc half-ogres. The other one is named Garona half Orson and she was half-orc, half-human, but that was retconned to being half trainai and then her son, who I guess is one quarter orc? It's obvious to me that Blizzard wants to move away from half-orcs and their media at all. Whenever I make these videos, I usually must stumble through a lot of garbage online in my research. I'm bombarded by AI art when I'm trying to find pictures for the background, a lot of people make claims without proof or wild assertions about things that they definitely know are true, and it gets difficult at times. This video is different though. Instead of the usual issues, I got swarmed by people making grand political statements about half-orcs. I honestly don't care where you line up politically. Of course I have my own politics, I won't pretend otherwise, but I want to keep them out of this hobby as much as possible. I wish that I'd found more people talking about mechanics or the way to use these guys or even the history behind them, but instead it got mired in racial issues, sexual dynamics, or morality on evil. It's because of these hot button issues that I believe nobody wants to touch half orcs anymore and why they've been basically removed from all of fantasy. Heck, Dungeons & Dragons is doing away with them as well, if the rumors on the new update are to be believed. 
I'll get to my own thoughts on half orcs in a minute. But if I'm going to look at it as a race and try to make them work in the modern era, what would I do instead? I would take the half orc and make them much more of an edge of civilization race. If orcs exist as raiders and warriors who live in the woods or on the fringes of civilization, then those humans that live near the fringes would interact with orcs. Perhaps through political marriages or chance encounters in the wilderness, human men and orc women or orc men and human women would meet and fall in love. What if there's a human village that has a yearly festival where a tribe of orcs come in and they celebrate the harvest together? Think kind of like the American Thanksgiving festivals that we grew up seeing with the Native Americans and the pilgrims sharing food and celebrating the harvest. Obviously, some chance encounters with the half-orcs, and I don't think they need to be as stigmatized for this. Maybe more civilized folks view them weird, but people in their hometowns would think of them as a natural outcome of the two races intermixing. I could also see some inner city noble going after orc wives and husbands as sort of a trophy. The idea that this man was able to tame such a powerful warrior woman, or this woman was able to civilize this great barbarian, would definitely hold prestige in some cultures, and would give his sons and daughters natural physical advantages. If orcs exist in your setting and act like the Mongolians did in real life, then perhaps the ruling class of a lot of villages at one point was an orc, and his descendants would all be half-orcs. Never mind if you have a fully civilized group of orcs in your setting, if your orcs are just capitalists and industrialists, like I suggested in my How to World Build with Orcs video, linked here, then obviously they would intermingle with human nobles who were like the old money in the Victorian era. There are lots of places for them if you want to include half-orcs as a race, and I don't think that removing them because you think they're slightly controversial or are scared of other people will think that they're controversial is a good reason. Now, like I said earlier, I have a different opinion on half orcs than you might get from this video. I actually really don't like the race, ironically. I don't like any of the mixed heritage options, such as half elves or wolves either. I find the mixed heritage races that are given in fantasy to be terribly done. I'm going to put a funny chart up on screen right now. This is from an earlier edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and it shows the sexual compatibility between all the races and monsters in the settings. Besides being absolutely hysterical, this is honestly so complicated for what I consider no game. This chart, and almost all other charts like it, are built off a world where humans are considered the default race, and you cannot play other races, so having everything be human-centric makes sense. This is how the original D&D world was designed, like I mentioned earlier. This means that if you're going to make regular orcs a playable race, half-orcs have no place mechanically. And if you do want to have half-orcs, I think they work better as some sort of bonus on top of your regular race. I don't see why mechanically you cannot find a way to make a half-dwarf, half-orc, for example. In my own setting of Enos, I take an approach where children of mixed heritage are biologically like the mother. Sometimes you'll have a few small traits from the father, but all the mechanical purposes, they are the mother race. This means that if you have an orc mother and a dwarf father, the daughter will look like an orc, except maybe wider in frame and shorter than other orcs. I feel like this removes a lot of the unnecessary steps that fantasy has kept after they stopped focusing on human-centric fantasy. Now, you might be asking, what about things like vampires or half-vampires, or the Ganassi, which are half-elementals? I also dislike them. By putting them as a race, you imply they are much more common than they should be in most fantasy. I think the worst offender of this is the Tiefling. They have a demonic heritage about them, and everybody assumes that your parentage must be a demon or a devil, and if you read the actual lore, it can be things such as your parents made a deal with the devil and now you've been corrupted, or maybe an ancestor was related to a devil and it's only manifesting in you, or as a child you were killed and raised back by a devil for an unknown purpose. 
these are a lot cooler and more interesting options, but don't really fit a race. I'm not going to go into the details of how it works in my own game. You can play it someday. But from a mixed heritage, I think this is a much more interesting mechanic to add it on top of your basic race, which will allow you to play into it as much or as little as you want. That is all for today. Thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed the content, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. I'm looking forward to your candor in the comments below, and have a great day. Also, a uh, quick side note, I'm most likely going to be launching a Patreon and a Discord soon, so keep your eyes peeled on the community tab. Have a great day.